Hi, I'm Jonathan Landsman, your host for the Natural News Inner Circle, and today we've got a real treat for you. We're going to be talking about sprouts, and I am with Steve Meyerowitz. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Happy to be here, Jonathan. For those of you who aren't familiar, Steve is a top expert when it comes to sprouting, the value of sprouts, why you should be incorporating it into your life. Steve, for those who don't know much about your work, you know, you've written a lot extensively over the years, uh, since the 70s, right? Since the 70s, 1977 was my first class, my first opportunity to share with people uh, how this kind of kitchen gardening can really better your health. I thought it would be a real treat. A lot of people don't hear directly from the author. You've got three books here that I've got. I wanted to ask you about Sprouts, The Miracle Food. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, this is a how-to book. So this book is actually a gardening book and it's a nutrition book. And to this day, it still has the most information in print on the nutrition of growing these baby foods. And you also have another book here, which is, looks really beautiful, Kitchen Garden. Tell us about that. This is a recipe book. So this is the, the place you go if you need some suggestions as to what you can do with all these things that you can grow in your own house. And that includes everything from breads and crackers and cookies and cakes, but there's no flour in any of this. This is all 100% sprouts. That's great. And then, of course, uh, everybody loves the taste of wheatgrass, so <laughs> what's this all about with, the, with this book, Wheatgrass? <laughs> well, even if you don't love the taste of wheatgrass, you may not love the medicine you have to take sometimes, but this is potent medicine. I believe wheatgrass is the most potent vegetable we have on the planet. And it's just unfortunate that uh, we can't throw it in our salad, we have to juice it. Well. You know, um, back when I first got started in, on this path, I was looking for a source of organic food. And organic food, as you know, is more expensive than commercial produce. Um, it's harder to find. And back in the 70s, when I was on my health crusade, my personal path to solve my health issues, um, it was harder to find organic food, but I was convinced if I wanted to, that, that I was convinced that the first thing I had to do to resolve my health issues was to get the poisons out of my system. And in order to do this, um, I wanted to have the purest food and the purest water. And that means organics. And unfortunately, as someone who grew up in New York City, living 14 stories in an apartment building, 14 stories above the sidewalks of New York. I wasn't able to get quality food, especially in the wintertime, because uh, let's face it, when you're in a northern climate, food comes from the southern climates, and that food was coming from the Salinas Valley of California. <clears throat> it was uh, coming 3,000 miles away. Um, it was no longer fresh after such a journey. Um, when, when you harvest a vegetable from the ground, that uh, plant starts a process of decay. It starts to actually die because you've cut off of its life source and its food source. And so <clears throat> there's this whole transportation issue when food is tr uh, has to travel long distance. And during that time, Days go by before it actually makes it onto the shelves of your local marketplace. And you're paying for the price of transportation in that you're paying for the, um, the, the fuel. And as you know, fuel is going up with every decade. So uh, there are a lot of costs involved in this kind of distribution network. And that's why I wanted something that was local and that was fresh, but how do you do that in the middle of January in New York City? So this is where the sprouts came in because when, you know, I'm all for local agriculture, I'm all for going to the farmer's markets in the summertime, but let's face it, in a northern climate like New York City, you've got a four month growing period, maybe five if you stretch it with greenhouses. So I started growing myself in my apartment. Now, I had green plants growing in my apartment, as many New Yorkers have, as many people in apartment buildings in big cities all over the world have. Well, why not spend that time in that space 
with green plants that can actually feed you. So it's a little more work in the gardening than a house plant, but why not have house plants that are edible? And this was my source for organic living food, fresh, just like when you go out to the backyard garden and you pick that food, you know that's the best food in the world. You don't need any university research to prove it to you. That's the quality that I get in my kitchen garden every year, every day of the year. Well, you know, believe it or not, there's quite a long list of things that can be grown. Uh, you know, when you go to the vegetable stand and you're buying vegetables for your salad, um, maybe you're buying lettuce, uh, you're buying tomatoes, uh, you're buying uh, broccoli, uh, maybe you're buying cabbage, maybe you're buying kale, maybe you're buying radishes. You know, all these things can be grown as baby vegetables. That's the thing about sprouts. People tend to think of sprouts as being the bean sprouts, like the Asians do. You know, the, the Japanese and the Chinese are growing mung bean sprouts and they're growing um, uh, soybean sprouts. But no, I'm not as interested in beans with a tail on it. I want a replacement for the greens that are in the produce stand. But I want a replacement that's fresh and alive. Um, I, want the, I want to basically bring my backyard garden into my kitchen without soil. I don't want to have to mess with that uh, messy business of soil. I want to be able to do this in a short uh, growing period. And, uh, and I can, you know, kale, radish, cabbage, broccoli, um, all of these are vegetables you're familiar with, sunflowers, instead of the six foot tall sunflower plant in your backyard, this is a six to eight inch tall sunflower plant. And you're eating the first green leaves of that vegetable rather than a whole stalk. Um, we grow pea shoots, which are the greens from uh, peas. Um, we grow things that you won't find in the produce stand, but you find on every field, uh, and every cow and every horse and every goat, every pasture grazing animal is eating alfalfa, is eating clover, is eating buckwheat, and these are actually greens. These are leafy green vegetables. The reason why you don't find them and your, in your produce stand is because they're loaded with too much fiber when they mature. But uh, that's okay if you're uh, a cow and you have a, a ruminant stomach, which you can digest all this fiber. But um, we grow them as a seedling to the first leaf stage of the vegetable. And at that point, the alfalfa is very delicate. The buckwheat is absolutely succulent. It actually looks like a four-leaf clover. Um, and the clover, red clover, crimson clover, these are all gardens of greenery uh, that you have. So, and, and you know, we can also grow the grains. If you think about um, grains like wheat and rye and kamut and spelt, um, these things are, can be grown and then you can grind up the sprouts from them and you use those to make breads and crackers and cookies. Uh, so, and this is a non-flower product. Beans, um, if you think about them, there is no society on our planet that will eat beans in the raw stage. The only way it can be accomplished, if you germinate them, you must germinate them in order to make them edible, either that or cooking. So, but when we cook, we're actually destroying. Uh, there is, uh, when a high heat to, uh, breaks down uh, proteins, it breaks down. Um, a lot of enzymes are destroyed, B vitamins are destroyed. So if you want life in your food, germinating them makes beans like garbanzo beans, green peas, lentils. Um, these um, uh, are all edible once they're germinated. So it's actually quite a big selection. So in a typical salad of mine, I will have sunflower sprouts. Uh, I, I will have um, in sunflower sprouts, I can actually show you what they look like. I have some here. So this is some sunflowers right here. And 
uh, I would just throw this in my salad. Just throw that in the salad, and that actually allows you to uh, have microgreens in your, in your salad. And then I will put in some buckwheat greens, and I'll put in some pea shoots. Uh, I have some pea shoots uh, sitting right here. So that's what pea shoots look like. And uh, then I'll put in some radish. I have some radish right here. This is baby radish plants right there. Absolutely delicious and really potent. Um, I can, uh, as far as some of the beans, I can throw these in for crunchy texture. So now we have over here mung beans and we have chickpeas and green peas. So we put all of these in, this, in the salad. And that gives that nice texture uh, to your salad. So, you know, when you think about it, if you were visiting my website, you would find 36 different flavors of things there that you can grow. And uh, if you think about what, um, what standard salad, salad, what's in standard salads, it's lettuce and tomato. And it's uh, maybe shredded cabbage. Uh, it doesn't get more glamorous than that. So I can make very interesting, very varied salads just with homegrown seeds. Well, the word uh, function uh, in, the, in when it's connected with food means that uh, food can actually produce an effect, just like if you take an aspirin, you can get rid of a headache. Um, and if you look at, um, uh, at some of the drugs which we use in our modern society, um, they're all plant-based. So even that aspirin I mentioned, it really comes from salicylic acid, which is scraped from the bark of the willow tree. Um, uh, ma uh, malaria drugs uh, were used originally from the bark of the cinchona tree. Um, you know, things like foxglove, uh, or, or that, that herb was used to make digitalis, uh, which prevents heart failure. So, you know, we can go on and on. Penicillin uh, is from a bacteria, it's really a, a mold. So, you know, all of this is um, going to plants to find natural medicine. And in these baby plants, there is a wealth of uh, wonderful medicine. For example, um, uh, radish sprouts, uh, when it grows, if you were to uh, compare, uh, if I were to, pl to plant this radish out in my backyard, uh, it would grow into a full radish vegetable. And then if you compare the nutrition of that radish vegetable to this radish in the baby stage, you would see approximately 40 to 80 times difference in the B vitamin content um, and a vitamin A, for example, the pro-vitamin A uh, in this plant is um, eight international units in the mature backyard grown vegetable, the organically grown vegetable, uh, but it's 391 in the sprouts. And uh, this, is, this literature comes from the, uh, the United States uh, Department of Agriculture. This is, uh, you know, very straight uh, science lab stuff. Um, if you look at broccoli and you, you look at um, uh, the amount of glucosinolates, which is a plant chemical, a plant compound that's in broccoli, um, scientists at uh, Johns Hopkins University found that the broccoli sprout at six days of age has 50 to 100 times more of those glucosinolates than the mature organic broccoli that you grow in the backyard. So we're talking about a dosage of plant compounds that can actually have an effect. In the case of glucosinolates, and we have much science on this and you can uh, find it all in my book, Sprouts the Miracle Food, that's where you'll, you'll find out that when you, when you eat broccoli and you get the glucosinolates, it converts into sulf sulforaphane, which is an enzyme it's the, that's processed by our digestive system. And sulforaphane actually has a, a tendency to sit on the alpha, alpha cell receptors on a tumor cell, uh, and it actually starves the, the tumor cell. And so we have study after study, and again, I'll refer you to my book, Sprouts of the Miracle Food, 
um, where you can actually review them uh, uh, showing that broccoli sprouts is a preventative, a preventive cancer agent. And so when you can use food as medicine, then we're, we're really um, not just eating, but now we're nourishing and using our food to heal ourselves. And this is what Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, 300 years before the common era, uh, was saying, you know, let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. So we've got all kinds of, not just vitamins that are in these baby plants, but we've got, so it's no longer uh, that, I'm, that it's enough to have just the A, B, C, D vitamins. Now we're talking about the plant compounds, those phytochemicals. Now we're talking about things, that you, and you know uh, these, uh, antioxidants and bioflavonoids and polyphenols. And then there's all kinds of very interesting things like phytosterols and uh, phytoestrogens used as a replacement for estrogen, uh, helping um, relieve menopause all symptoms, uh, helping incre increase bone density. Alpha, alpha sprouts have saponins in them. Saponins uh, are, sound like soap in the name. It actually is a kind of soap. And um, you know, when, when you're eating alfalfa, we have found that it's able to break down cl uh, clogged arteries, so it reduces cholesterol. So, you know, just like you use a detergent on your dishes to get the grease off of them, you know, we can take alf alpha sprouts as a detergent to get the grease out of our arteries. So the, there are a lot of anti-cholesterol uh, benefits, a lot of cardiovascular benefits, uh, a lot of anti-cancer benefits, th things like isoflavones that we find um, uh, in these sprouts. Uh, so, and, and when you germinate the vegetable, when you germinate that broccoli, you know, not only does it go up 50 to 100%, but the, um, the saponin content in alfalfa increases 450%. And um, the uh, uh, isoflavone, um, uh, the cholesterol content in soybean sprouts increases 4,000 percent. So th these are some amazing transformations just going from a seed to a baby version of the vegetable. And so when you have this density, this nutrient density, now we have a food that can actually, actually achieves the dosage level of like that aspirin, right? You couldn't get, you can't cure a headache scraping the bark of a, uh, a, a, of a tree, but you could concentrate it uh, and then uh, cure the headache. And that's what we're doing with these baby f vegetables. We're concentrating their natural medicines, their natural plant medicine, which originated you know, with the Greek pharmacopoeia. That's where all this pharmaceutical drugs originated from. So we're eating plant medicine and we're getting it in the a right dosage where we can actually achieve a health benefit. Well, you know, it's, it's really easy because re remember, this is a no-soil process. So um, all you really need uh, are some tools. And unlike the world of hydroponics where you're spending hundreds of dollars and you have these big units with lots of lighting uh, on them which take over, overwhelm your kitchen, um, sprouting can be much more space conservative Sprouting uh, can be is much more adaptable to your budget. Uh, I just sent uh, some of my sprouting bags uh, out to uh, the islands in uh, the middle of the uh, South Pacific because the food is terrible out there. They're just bringing in packaged boxed food and people need to grow something and the soil's bad out there because um, these are atolls. So these are uh, actually, you know, building on a kind of volcanic, uh, volcanic sand there, and they really can't grow uh, very much. So uh, even out there in the middle of the ocean, you know, in these tiny islands, uh, they're using sprout bags now uh, to grow a variety uh, of things. So, you know, a sprout bag works really like a tea bag. You know, you just take the, put the beans in, and then you dip it in a bowl, um, hold it there for 10 seconds, uh, and then you can hang this up on a hook 
or a knob, uh, a cup hook uh, will do. Um, and it drips for about 10 minutes, and then after that, if you want, you can just lay it aside uh, uh, in a bowl or in the dish rack. Um, so it's really easy to do the sprout bag, as I shared with you before. This is the radish sprouts, um, which are so rich in nutrition and so rich in flavor. And, you know, and if you look at the, the colors uh, here, um, you know, color doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, it's a representation of nutrition. Um, the flavor is so potent, and uh, that also represents nutrition. And the aroma, which will fill up your apartment and fill up your home, um, that, that's just telling us that there's something there in that plant that is so powerful that it effervesces into your air. And, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that, uh, it's the kind of reason why we are attracted to foods is because we can also in, we can also smell them because these are living foods so they're giving off oxygen and that oxygen is coming with their phytochemicals and so we pick up a scent we pick up an aroma and that uh, stimulates our olfactory uh, uh, resources and glands and we're uh, responding we're hungry we're interested and that only really happens you know from uh, a, a living food so. Um, so this is a beginner way to start. Uh, the sprout bag is something I invented back in the 70s because I was having trouble with using jars. You know, the old folklore, just use a jar. Put the seeds in a jar and put some cheesecloth on the top and, and that's all you need. Well, wow. I mean, I'm someone who, who have, has had thousands of students and over time I realized too many problems and the reason is that a jar traps air, a jar traps water and those are perfect breeding grounds for growing mold and mildew. I don't want that. So um, this is the, uh, this breathes on all sides. It drains on all sides. Very egalitarian. Every sprout gets the same amount of air and drainage and unlike a jar where you have to be lucky and just be close to the top to get your air close to that mouth of that jar. So, uh, so I gave up uh, jars back then, switched to the sprout bag. Everybody loves it. If you can use a tea bag, you can use a sprout bag. So uh, that's an easy way to start. It's an inexpensive way to, uh, to start, uh, but it won't quite give you um, the, you know, the vertical uh, look that you get from the greens. You know, here you have more surface area in this barrel, which is called my Fresh Life Sprouter. This barrel uh, is, uh, allows for more surface uh, contact with the sun and with light. And so uh, green leafy things that you want to have in your salad uh, grow best uh, in there. And, in, uh, and over here I have uh, sunflower uh, sprouts growing. And this is actually uh, an automatic grower. Um, you can uh, see it's spinning and watering now, but it goes, it waters about three times every hour. And so this is for people who uh, are willing to pay a few dollars more to have the watering done automatically uh, for them. Uh, whereas this one uh, over here, uh, you have to water by hand. So you have your option and again, very uh, affordable. Uh, over here in this tray, uh, we see some wheatgrass growing. So this is yet another grower. It's not automatically watering. You have to water yourself. Um, but it's a very uh, nice system that can fit in a kitchen uh, without taking up uh, too much space. And, uh, but this is obviously for more volume uh, because if you're uh, growing wheatgrass for your health, you need to make lots of wheatgrass juice. So you need more volume and maybe that's more volume than this provides. Although this unit, the automatic unit, will actually stack so you can get three levels high on it. But uh, uh, perhaps um, this is where I should talk about the seeds because seeds are really important in this uh, picture here because the seeds that you find in the bulk bins in the health food stores are really intended for cooking. So, um, you know, even if you get them organic, uh, which is great, you know, I'm the author of a book on organic food, so I'm, I'm part of that movement, but all it tells us is how the farmer farmed. It doesn't tell us whether or not it's going to make delicious sprouts. Someone has to test that, and that's why you have people like myself who uh, test everything. I won't put 
my, uh, seeds into a package with my name on it until I've grown it. And I grow it multiple times because I want to make sure that this stuff really works. I'm looking for, you know, taste. I'm looking for the color of the roots are nice and healthy and white. I'm looking for how tall it grows, how fast it grows. Uh, I'm looking for how quickly it sheds its Sh uh, shells, its jackets, its seed jackets. So, you know, these are things that unless someone does the job of testing it before they put it into a bag and sell it, you're not going to get. So, um, the organic seeds, by the way, the certification of organic is not where it ends. Uh, organic certification gives us a lot of information, though. It tells us that it's not been genetically modified. That's part of the organic cert certification is a genetic uh, non-GMO certification. That's really, really important uh, these days. Also important is testing for pathogens. So I want to make sure that my seeds were never contaminated along the line. No E. coli, no salmonella, no listeria, none of that, no yeasts or molds. And uh, so this testing is an expense, but it's absolutely necessary. But what also makes these seeds special is because, you know, you think, well, maybe I can go to the garden store and, you know, they grow, uh, they have vegetable seed there. Uh, but actually those little packets of seeds for the backyard garden, a really expensive way to buy seeds because you only get a few grams uh, in there where in the sprouting world, we, we, grow, we, we grow so much we have seed intensive gardening, we need a lot of seeds. So you're going to buy a pound of seeds and it's really a better, more economical way to get the seeds. And our seeds, it's really important that our seeds are, are, are uh, have very high germ counts. You can have a low ger germ count in the backyard garden and you know maybe 20% of the seeds won't grow in the backyard gar garden, you'll never notice it. But in the kitchen garden, you'll see it, it'll come up as mold um, and it'll smell funny and uh, you won't like it at all. So we got to get up in the 90s uh, for these kind of seeds. So this is a specialty seed and you really should be buying from someone like myself who's in the sprouting seed business to get the best results because this is seed intensive gardening. So the seed is the most important part. Well, you know, uh, uh, wheatgrass is in a special class as a sprout. You know, it's, it's one of these big sprouts, which we call microgreens, um, but it's in a, cl a special class because it's not edible. Um, it's not edible and, unless, uh, like I said before, you are a ruminant animal with multi-tier stomachs and you can digest the, all the fiber in there. So uh, we can't actually chew on wheatgrass and swallow it, but what we can do is extract its juice. And when juice extractors uh, for wheatgrass came along, that started uh, the whole use of this very potent vegetable as, uh, as a healing food. Um, and Wigmore started to popularize the use of wheatgrass to treat cancer patients back in the late 1950s in Boston. And uh, she didn't know why it was working, but it was working. And uh, these days we have since discovered that wheatgrass, this, this simple little plant that we see right here, um, this is very young, it's gonna grow maybe, maybe to about that height. Uh, uh, when juiced and when used on a regular basis in an, enough quantity so that you get the, a, a therapeutic dosage, very important, the difference between an, an effect and no effect. That juice actually is a powerful liver detoxifier. And, you know, think about it. If you had something that could detoxify your liver, this, this, this super important organ, which is bigger than the stomach in size in, in some people, that's, uh, uh, that's going to go a long way to reversing disease. So we've got a strong liver detoxifier, but in addition, we have a powerful blood purifier in wheatgrass. I mean, it is, if you look at the chlorophyll molecule and it's rich, a rich source of chlorophyll, the chlorophyll molecule and the, the molecule for hemin, part of hemoglobin, are almost essentially the same, except that chlorophyll has magnesium as the bond in that molecule. And, um, and blood has iron as the bond in that molecule. So um, it's a wonderful blood purifier, blood replacement. It's drinking that juice. Uh, and, if you, uh, and it's a terrific um, colon cleanser uh, as well. 
Uh, it has um, uh, plant hormones uh, in there that are very powerful for healing uh, skin issues. Um, I have a lot of people uh, who use uh, a wheatgrass cream for uh, that, and they were using it and over and over again. I've got some pictures on my website of healing, you know, uh, eczema and psoriasis. Um, it, it, so if you think about it, if you had a food that could cleanse uh, your intestines and uh, could rejuvenate your bloodstream uh, and detox your, your liver, um, of course you're going to get healthier. A lot of problems fall away because, you know, symptoms show up in all kinds of places in the body. But we've got to get to the root cause. And the root cause um, is uh, often toxicity, uh, often inflammation, and also infestation. So, uh, you know, once we start to cleanse the bloodstream, cleanse the intestinal tract, and detoxify the liver, now we're starting to reverse disease and the symptoms start to disappear because overall we're restoring the body back to its more he original healthy state. And that's the way to resolve the little problems, the big picture approach rather than the symptom approach. So is it camera rolling? Oh, it is. Listen, it's <laughs> great, great information, Steve. Mm -hmm. All this is great, but we hear these terms all the time, raw food, living food. Is there a difference? Help me out. Oh, while I eat. There, there is, there is a difference between what we're eating now, these baby sunflower seeds, okay. and um, say a carrot. You know, a carrot is a raw food, okay. um, and raw foods are are uh, wonderful. Uh, but a living food is a food like this that actually up to a few minutes ago before I, pl uh, I picked it uh, was actually still growing. So this is again back to that concept that I shared with you earlier about you go to the backyard garden and you pluck that food, you know that's the best food in the world. And that's alive and that is effervescing with its vitamins, you know you've got the ar aroma coming off of it and you've got uh, nutrition in there that you you really can't get in that carrot. You know, let's say that carrot, or let's compare it. Uh, let's compare these baby greens to uh, a head of lettuce. All right. So if you compare um, romaine lettuce or head, common head lettuce, um, uh, th these greens, alfalfa sprouts, a lot of the sprouts have about four percent protein uh, in them. Um, the uh, the head lettuce has less than one percent protein in it. Now, none of these greens are considered protein foods. However, um, if you have a food that is producing that much protein, that's a non-protein food producing that much protein, then there's got to be vitamins behind it because they are part of the building blocks of protein. And there's got to be minerals and trace minerals uh, and electrolytes behind it because that's part of the building blocks for vitamins. So um, when you get a food uh, like uh, these greens that are so alive, uh, you've got this extra nutrition, you've got those plant compounds I was talking about earlier uh, as well, the bioflavonoids and the polyphenols and the isoflavones and the glucosinolates. But, um, you know, the other problem is uh, what I mentioned b before about um, uh, the foods that uh, we buy in the produce stand that are really no longer f filled with their life force. Uh, because they're so old, uh, because as soon as they're separated, they're, they're chopped uh, from the capitated from the earth, they're separated from their roots, they're separated from their life force. And as they travel on the airplane and, you know, in the containers and on the trip to uh, the grocery store and the wholesale markets, uh, and by the time it gets to you, it's been dying and decaying with each day. So that carrot I mentioned, that head of romaine lettuce, um, is no longer has that vitality. And when you think about these living foods, you know, the vitality is there because I just harvested this seconds ago. So now we have in there an energetic factor that is much higher than you find in regular produce, which is a raw food. But that energetic factor is really what's part of our healing because the, the body is energy and food can be a source of energy for us, right? It's, I mean, if you ask, people who uh, wake up in the morning and they can't even talk to you until they get their coffee, you know? That's, the, that's a stimulant, that's not energy. But if you had a shot of wheatgrass juice in the morning, 
that would be energy, all right? That's not stimulation. That, that's um, enhancement and immune system support, and that gives you a long-term energy. So the living foods, like these baby plants, that's, is, that's actually like charging your battery. So, you know, I, I like to say, you know, you, you, you plug your, your cell phone in every day, and how about we plug our bodies in every day to an energy source, a living food source. This is the electricity that comes out of our food. In my, in my book on wheatgrass, I have an energy photo. It's a Curlian photograph, which is like an aura photograph, which shows the aura that comes off of living foods, because living foods have a radiation, just like if you've ever had an aura photograph taken of you, um, you can see there are the, all these colors around you because you're an electromagnetic energetic being, and these foods have that same life force, all right? So that's the difference. You've got a food that's alive right now and that is scintillating and that is effervescing and that is dancing with enzymes and energy versus a food that's, been, that's not been cooked, but it's been on a long journey for, for thousands of miles to get to you and many days. And during that process, it's losing vitamins, um, it's, it's losing its enzymes, and it's losing its life force. So if we want to recharge our batteries for better healing, we've got to stick with living foods. Wow, Steve, a lot of great information. Thank you so much for spending time with us. My pleasure. It's great, I hope you enjoyed this program. Get out there and sprout. Look at all this stuff here, it's fantastic. You can go to sproutman.com, I'm sure you can get all this information. Get, wait, wait, wait a minute, get, give me some of this. <laughs> Underneath here, what, what is this here? This is all, it's all living here. Radish. Well, Thank you. Mm. I hope you enjoyed the program. Mm. Happy sprouting. Take care, everybody.